this week we have Pastor Sean Williams coming from Willow Creek Community Church all the way from Windy City, Chicago, Illinois. Let's welcome back Pastor Sean. Well, good morning. Great to see you this morning. Uh, I was here in June, so I see a few familiar faces. So thanks for the invite back. Great to be here at Hills this weekend. I'm a longtime friend of Matt and Amy Kowalski. Grateful for you guys and your leadership around here at Hills. Now, I was talking to Matt a little bit this week and said, so tell me like what, a bit, what has been talked about all summer long? And he mentioned that there's a couple of the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter five that have been touched on. And so kind of keeping with the theme that has at least been touched on a couple of times uh, throughout Throughout the year, I'm going to be in Galatians chapter five, at least as a starting point, as we dive into the fruit of the spirit of goodness. Now, again, if you're unfamiliar with it, Paul wrote these fruit of the spirit, these character traits of God, that when we walk with God, these character traits of God become our character traits as well. And so Paul writes them and he says, well, here's what the fruit of the spirit are. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, what's interesting about this list in Galatians chapter five, these fruit of the spirit, most of them are things that you would aspire to do. Like most of us, we want to be more loving. We want to be more joy filled. We want to have more peace. All that sounds great. You get to the sixth one where it says goodness. And at least when you're young, this is not the one you aspire to. Cause I think about like when I was in elementary school or junior high school or sometimes even high school, we made fun of the good kids. Did you do that? Okay, it was just me. Okay, I made fun of the good kids. We would come up with names to make fun of the good kids. We would call them things like goody two shoes. I heard that. I I said the same thing. Brown noser, I heard. I mean, you might come up with a few more we can't say in church. I'll let you off the hook, right? But we made fun of the good kids uh, because it just kind of felt a little bit obnoxious to us. But here's the thing. When it comes to goodness, don't we might have some resistance to becoming the good kid, at least when we were younger, because maybe we want to be more like what Billy Eilish sings, we want to be the bad guy. But the truth is, the reason we had resistance to it is because it felt inauthentic to us. Like, like goodness that's not genuine is pretty repulsive. But I would say goodness, that people are good to the core, and you probably know some people like this. There's something about people when they're good to the core that that's an attractive characteristic or trait. We want to be around people like that. We want to become more like those people. And the truth is when it's God's goodness that's infused somebody's life, it not only makes that person attractive, it makes the God they serve also attractive. And so though when we're young, we might have some resistance around this idea of goodness. I think this is one of those traits of God that is worth aspiring to, wanting God to infuse this character trait in each one of our lives. Now, as I think about goodness, I wanna talk about three principles of goodness that I think are really important. Here's the first, that truly only God is good. In other words, God is the one who's really good and frankly, we're not really now, some of you might push back a little bit on me and you go, but, but Sean, if you really knew me, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And if I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you think by and large, you're a pretty good person? Most of us would likely raise our hands. My question is, by what standard? Think about it this way. Uh, when I was a younger parent, I, my boys are older now, they're both in high school, but when I was a younger parent, uh, we would oftentimes go on a date, we'd leave our boys with the babysitter, and before we would leave the house, we would sometimes tell and sometimes threaten our children, and we would tell them, while we're, go- good, I'm sorry, while we're gone, you must be good. Like you did the same thing as a parent, right? And again, depending on how tough the day was, Sometimes we elevated the threat level of they needed to be good for the babysitter while we were gone. And so we'd go into the day, we'd have a great time. We would come back to the house. The very first question we would ask our kids when we walked in the door was what? Were you good? We all do the same thing, right? And every single time you ever ask that question to your kids, what do they respond? Yeah, we were good. Was there ever a doubt that we were good? Now the question is, what standard were they judging their goodness by? Basically what they were saying is, for the last two hours, I didn't stuff my brother's head in the toilet. Over the past couple hours, I didn't set the house on fire. I mean, it was not like my boys were baking cookies for the single mom down the street. 
It's not like they initiated a fundraising effort for the global poor. It's not like they made some blankets for the local hospital's cancer patients, right? And so by what standard of good? They set a very low bar for themselves that they were clearing. And so the question becomes, if you're really wanting to discover whether I'm good through and through, by what standard do we measure goodness? Now, it's fascinating. Jesus one time was called a good teacher. And his response is somewhat surprising. Here's Jesus' response. When he was called good in Mark chapter 10, Jesus says this, why do you call me good? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. Now, quick caveat here real quick. This is not suggesting that Jesus is saying he was good and uh, he was not good and only God is good. Uh, Because Jesus was God incarnate. He was God in the flesh. Jesus is good through and through. What he's trying to make the distinction is, is there's a difference between divinity and humanity. God is the one who's good. God is always good. He always has been. He is, he always will be. God, God is perfect. He's without blemish. He's faultless. Uh, God has pure motives. He wants what's best for his children. God is good through and through. And Jesus is drawing the distinction. There's a difference between divinity and humanity because the truth is I fall woefully short. The truth is I'm sin prone. I'm full of mistakes. I have impure motives at times. There's times that even my intentions aren't as good as I want to portray them being. The truth is only God is truly good. Now, some of you might push back a little bit and go like, I get it, okay, but you don't know me. I'm actually still pretty good. But again, by what standard? And so maybe let me exemplify it in this way. Uh, If there was a standard for goodness, which I'm not suggesting there is, but if there was a standard for goodness, maybe the 10 commandments would be that kind of standard. 10 commandments first came off the pen of, uh, or maybe off the chisel, I'm not sure, of Moses some 3,500 years ago. It's really stood the test of time. I mean, entire societies have been framed around the 10 commandments. They've served as even laws to this day. Sometimes you'll even see them in courtrooms even to this day. And so if you were to have a standard, maybe the 10 commandments would be a decent standard that we could, tr- we could verify our goodness against it. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give myself a pop quiz to see how my life matches up with the 10 commandments. If you'd like to, you can give your own life a a self-assessment as well. You don't have to share your answers with your neighbors. You can if you want, but you don't have to. And just kind of see how do our lives from a goodness perspective match up to the 10 commandments? Here's the first one. First commandment is this. God says, have no other gods before me. So basically what this commandment is about is God saying, I want to be number one at every moment of every day of all time. I want to be your highest priority in life. Here's the question. Has there ever been a time where God was not number one in your life? Has there ever been a time that something else had a higher priority than God? For me, I've broken commandment number one. There have been other things that I put as higher importance that displace God on the throne of my heart in my life. What about commandment two? Commandment two says, don't worship idols. And so maybe you'd say, well, I've never melted down gold. I've never fashioned an idol. I've never like bowed down to it because that would be weird. And we don't really think about that. We don't necessarily do that in today's terms, but in our day and age, we idolize all kinds of things. We'll idolize an athlete or a celebrity. We'll we'll idolize a dream or an aspiration. We make all kinds of things into idols. Uh, Maybe think about it this way. How many of you have ever been to a worship night here at Hills? or Maybe you've been to a worship concert of some kind. Okay, a few of you, everybody's invited to the one that's coming up. And so if you think about uh, these worship experiences, I I love them. There's something about music that connects our heart to God's heart. It's a beautiful experience. Now I've been a part of some really powerful worship nights and worship experiences. I mean, moments, you know, where your hands are in the air, you're singing the lyrics. Maybe you look over to somebody and you see little tears streaming down somebody's face. It's a beautiful moment. Now, if somebody were to take a camera and capture a photo of that particular moment and then compared it to a different moment, how many of you went to T. Swift's Eras Tour? You went to a concert. I need to hang out with you guys and why didn't I get an invite? I didn't get to go. I uh, just 
didn't wanna pay that kind of money to go. But if you were to go, uh, I hear it was an amazing experience. And if you were at a show, either that show or a show like it, what you might find is you'll have some people who are raising their hands and singing the lyrics. You might even find a tear rolling down somebody's face. And if somebody snapped a picture of that and you compare the two photos, they look strikingly similar, don't they? Now, I'm not trying to trash those who went to the Eras tour. It's totally fine going to concert. I'm, I'm challenging the fact that sometimes we make things into idols that don't deserve that amount of aff- affection and devotion that we give it. The truth is in my life with commandment two, I've broken commandment number two. Commandment three, uh, don't use the Lord's name in vain. And maybe you say, I've never said GD. Well, that's great. That's just not what this commandment's about. Uh, this commandment's about when we claim the name of Christ or claim the name of God, but go live in a way that's contrary to that name. Thus, by the way we live, we end up dragging God's name through the mud. In other words, have you ever claimed the name of Christ, but ignored the poor? Have you ever claimed the name of Christ, but slandered a coworker? The truth is, as I look over my shoulder, there've been far too many times where I have used the Lord's name in vain in that way. I've broken commandment number three. Commandment number four of keeping the Sabbath is the only one that I feel guilty about when I obey it. I don't know about you, uh, but I'm a pretty driven person, pretty goal-oriented person. I like to do stuff. I like to accomplish stuff. And so it's hard for me to slow down. And when I slow down, I typically feel guilty for slowing down. But if I, for whatever reason, I'm able to finally take a rest, it's not just about taking a rest and taking a Sabbath. I don't often make that Sabbath holy. I've broken commandment number four more than one time. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother. I didn't make it to my second birthday before breaking this one, right? And so this is kind of one that that, uh, that we're all probably guilty of at some level. How about commandment number six? You're like, please, pastor, tell me you've never killed somebody. Uh, I've never physically taken somebody else's life. However, Jesus makes this one more of a heart issue, doesn't he? Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, Matthew chapter five, Jesus says, you've heard that it says, do not commit murder, but I tell you, do not be angry with your brother because you've already committed murder in your own heart. Have you ever lashed out in anger towards somebody for unrighteous reasons? Me too. I've broken commandment number six. How about commandment number seven? Do not commit adultery. Again, I've never cheated on my spouse. However, Jesus makes this one a heart issue as well. And Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, don't even look at someone lustfully because you've already committed adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked at somebody who is not your spouse with lust? Me too. I've broken commandment number seven. How about commandment number eight? Uh, Have you ever stolen something? Have you ever stolen a ream of paper from the office, something in the checkout line when you're going through the grocery store? I heard a comedian say that they put their groceries uh, at the checkout counter at the grocery store. The bill was too much. And so they gathered everything back and went to the self-checkout to give themselves a discount, which you should not do, by the way, right? But have you ever stolen something? Maybe some of us said, I have never actually taken anything physically. And maybe that's true. But with the harsh word, Have you ever stolen somebody's confidence? Uh, Through a slanderous saying, have you ever ever stolen somebody's reputation? The truth is I look back over my shoulder, I'm not unblemished with this one. I've, I've broken commandment number eight. Commandment number nine is don't bear false testimony. In other words, like don't lie. If I told you that I'd never lied, that would be a lie. I've broken commandment number nine. How about number 10? Uh, Don't covet your neighbor's possession. In other words, if you ever wanted something that somebody else had really, really bad, you wanted it as your own, you're like, yeah, it's what I stole. (laughs) The truth is I've broken all 10 commandments at some point in my journey. Why do I go through that? It's because sometimes we can convince ourselves that we are good. The truth is, By even the most basic standards, we fall woefully short. The truth is only God is truly good. That's principle number one. Here's principle number two, that our goodness, because the truth is there are some good parts about us, but I would say our goodness has gaps in it. 
Because you would say, and rightly so, you'd say, but that doesn't mean that there aren't moments that I am good and that I do good things and right things. And I would say that's absolutely true. It's just that our goodness has gaps in it. In other words, we're not good through and through all the time in every moment of all times, that there are moments that we have some goodness, there's other moments we have some goodness, and there's oftentimes gaps between them. Now, the way I think about it is this way. I think that a lot of times you and I, we live very compartmentalized types of lives. In other words, I show up maybe different in different settings, that that who I am at work may be a little bit different than who I am at home, and who I am uh, in a social setting is maybe a little bit different than who I show up in a, in a church setting type thing. And if we're not careful, we can live these very compartmentalized types of lives. And so one of the things that I think serves us well is when we live integrated types of lives. In other words, I show up the same way everywhere I go. It's an integrated type of life. Now, another word that sounds a lot like an integrated type of life is the word integrity which is also really connected to goodness. What's integrity? Integrity is when I show up as the same person every venue I show up in. The person I am at work is the person I'm at at home. The person I am socially is the person I am at church. I live with integrity everywhere I go. But it's not just that. Sure, it's an integrated type of life, but if I show up the same way as a jerk everywhere, that doesn't feel like it's got a lot of integrity. And so in one way, it's, 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 uh, uh, the, the integrity means I'm the same person everywhere. But the other piece of integrity is that everywhere I show up, I represent the goodness that God has put in me. In other words, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, then you embrace the values that he's putting in your life. And integrity means that I show up in every single arena being driven by those values. In other words, the choices I make at work are dictated by my relationship with Jesus. How I show up at home, my willingness to forgive quickly, my willingness to love through hard things, my willingness to to help us come together as a household, those are things that are dictated by my relationship with God. When it comes to social settings, who I hang out with and what we're doing is dictated because of the values of what it means to follow Jesus. When I show up at church, Again, it, it driven by my relationship with God. So integrity means I show up the same person everywhere, but integrity also means that I show up with goodness every single place that I go. Now, what's true about all of us is there are moments that we have integrity, but there's also just gaps in our integrity. And when there's gaps in our integrity, we often experience the the pain associated with it. I would say like self-induced pain that we experience in life. Now life throws us all kinds of things and, and we will have a you know, hardship in life no matter what. But so much of the hardship we face is self-induced connected to the gaps within our integrity. Because integrity sometimes requires us to do the hard thing. It requires us to be a little bit more intentional. It requires oftentimes much more time. It's way easier to cut a corner. It reminds me of a story that I heard Craig Rochelle tell a long time ago. Pastor Craig de- describes this, this story of a guy who is this master builder. He was a residential builder. He was known for his incredible craftsmanship. Now he worked for a larger building company, but he was the most sought out builder within within the company because he was just, his reputation was incredible. He used the best materials, the best building process. He created the, the, the best structures. They were the types of things that if you knew if this guy built your house, it was gonna be of the highest quality, his bones were gonna be good, it was gonna stand the test of time. Now he had been with the same company for almost four decades and he decided it was finally time to to kind of hang it up and ride in the sunset. He set a retirement date. And he decided he was gonna set the retirement date at the the day that he was with the company for 40 years. Just kind of a monumental type of day. And the closer that it got, the more excited that he got about it. And so he started counting down the days, you know, from 12 months to nine months to six months to three months. At the three month mark, the owner of the company approached this builder and said, hey, I know you're about to retire, but would you do one more project for me? He's like, ah, I don't know. Because if I start a project now, it will go well beyond my retirement date. There's no way I could finish it within three months. 
And so the, the owner kind of pressed him a little bit more. They had a great relationship for such a long time. And so he leaned in the relationship and he goes, I'm just asking you for one more project. Would you just do one more for me? And a little bit begrudgingly, he finally agreed to do it. But the truth is his heart wasn't in it. And so for this particular project, because he didn't wanna spend the amount of time that he typically spent, he decided he would cut some corners. He didn't use the best materials. He didn't use his normal uh, you know, processes uh, because time was of the essence for him. And so he took a lot of short, because now the truth is from the outside looking in, nobody would ever really be able to know. But he knew, he knew the bones weren't as good and likely this structure wouldn't hold the test of time. Well, nevertheless, he wrapped up the project. He handed the keys to the owner and he was about ready to retire. And, and, and the owner of the company decided to throw him a, a huge uh, send-off party for his retirement. I mean, it's well-deserved, over four decades in the business. And so he invited the whole company, like the family of the employees. It was a huge party to celebrate. And toward the end of the party, uh, they, they decided that they wanted to give him a gift. And so the owner gives this big, long speech talking about all the, the accolades that this builder had built up over the years. And he said, I would love to present you with this gift and handed him the keys of the house that he had just built. Here's the point of the story. You and I, we are living in the houses that we are building. We are living the lives that we are building. And the truth is for you and I, integrity is harder, takes more time. Oftentimes there's a cost to it, but without it, we end up paying a price that we don't want to pay. We are living the lives that we are building. Some people say that you and I were product of our environments. I think there's some truth in that. We're certainly influenced by our environments, but I would say we're actually not a product of our environment. We're a product of our choices. Researchers say that you and I, we make about 10,000 choices every single day. And so our lives become the summation of how much or little integrity we have when we make those decisions. You and I are living the lives. You and I are living in the houses that we are building. And certainly life will throw us some difficult things, but what we want to avoid is the self-induced challenges that come connected to a breach of integrity. What's fascinating about integrity is someone once said this, if you're willing to do the hard thing now, life ends up being easier in the long run. If you take the easy way now, life becomes harder in the long run. That's been my experience as well. But it's amazing how often we are tempted to take the shorter, easier route initially. And as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus, I'm not immune to it. It's just a few months ago that uh, at the church that I serve, it's a church called Willow Creek Community Church. And uh, at the church, one of our ministries is, is called the Care Center. It's a, it's a ministry that we have as an outward facing ministry that, that serves vulnerable people in our area, probably very similar to ministries that you have right here at Hills, Hills Church. And so at the, 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 through the Care Center, we have a food pantry, we have a place you can get clothes. Uh, you actually get dental exams, optical exams. We can fix your car, you know, things like that. And so what uh, kind of the, the focal point of the care center is our, uh, is our food pantry. Now, probably similar to Hills, the food pantry you have here, we receive some food that we give out through some government sources. Uh, government sources provide food to lots of different food pantries. And though it's supplemented by the church, some of the food actually comes from these sources and is distributed to people in need in our community. And so we work with a, with a local organization called the Greater Chicago Food Depository, again, connected to the federal government that provides food for those who are vulnerable in our area. Now we've partnered with them for, I mean, long, long, long time. But we recently transitioned to a new director of our care center. And when she took over, she started looking at all the details and the operational facets of the care center. And one of the things she looked at is she reviewed our contract with the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And in the contract, it specifies 
who we can serve and who we're not allowed to serve based on the geographical uh, place where that person lives. It is it's divided by the county. We can serve people who live in our county. We cannot serve people uh, in any neighboring county. And that actually creates a challenge for us because our church is right on the border of a county. And so what we didn't know is that we had been unknowingly serving people outside of our service area and we've been doing it for a long time. And so technically we were out of compliance with our contract of Greater Chicago Food Depository. When we realized that we did a lot of looking and uh, in the numbers around it and probably 40% of the guests that we served lived outside of our service area. Now we serve about 3000 families a month. So it's a massive number if we were to be compliant with the contract that we would have to turn away. And so when we initially saw it, the care center director brought it to me. She's like, what should we do? And I'm like, I'm not 100% sure what we should do. And so we sought out a little bit of counsel. I can't tell you how many people we contacted that said things like, hey, just ignore it. I mean, I mean, nobody knows. You've been doing it for a long time. Nobody's ever said anything. What makes you think that somebody can say now? People would tell us things like, well, just don't report that that's what you're doing. Again, it's not ever really gonna be found out. But that just didn't sit with us. We didn't feel like we could go about that that way because that route didn't have integrity. And we felt like we wanted to honor the people that we serve, but we wanna also honor the God that we're serving on his behalf. And so we made the decision we're gonna out ourselves, that we were out of compliance and we're gonna out ourselves and we've been out of compliance for a long time. And so I remember the meeting with Greater Chicago Food Depository that we said, hey, we've been serving people outside of our service area and we've been doing it for quite some time. And I'll tell you the looks on the faces of people who are like, I'm really sorry. Uh, we're doing the Lord's work. I'm sorry that we've, that we've done this, right? And so it was a pretty awkward meeting, but we asked that they would make an exception on our behalf because of the number of people and the volume that we serve. And they literally said in the moment, we don't have the authority, the authorization to grant that request. And so they told us that we needed to be able to prepare communication to let that 40% of the population know that we could no longer serve them in the way that we have been. It was a painful thing because we're like, we're doing God's work here and we have to turn people away from serving people. It just felt not right. And so we have this tension between what has integrity and what we felt called to do. But we felt like if God's calling us to do it, we got to do it in the right way. And so we decided we prepared that communication. We continued to talk to Greater Chicago. We continued to work through different things. They said that they would start chasing it up the governmental food chain. So they couldn't make the decision of their own, but they would appeal to the Illinois Food Bank. And they did that on our behalf. Illinois Food Bank came back and said, we also know, don't have the authority to uh, grant you permission to do that. So we're gonna chase it all the way up uh, to the Food and Drug Administration, of, like the feds. And so we were like, this is gonna take forever. And it did, it took months and months and months. Eventually we heard back from the USDA that not only granted us permission to do so, they granted us permission to serve any single person, no matter where they lived in the state of Illinois. It wasn't just about neighboring counties. They granted us the ability to serve anybody as long as they lived in the state of Illinois. But here's the really cool thing. They didn't just grant us the exception. They applied that exception to every single food pantry in the state of Illinois. That's what's possible through integrity. Does it always turn out that way? No. But I believe to the core of my being that our God is a good God. And over the course of time, God honors integrity. Is it more difficult? Yes. Is it more time consuming? Yes. Is it risky because you can't guarantee an outcome? For sure. Is it worth it? You better believe it. Because you and I are living in the houses we are building. We're living the lives that we are building. And the truth is only God is truly good. You you and I, we have some goodness, but there's some gaps in our integrity. And so here's the third principle, that we allow God to bring about good in our life. That we allow God to bring about good. Now, now this conversation is not about perfection because the truth is none of us will get this right 100% of the time. And so the way I talk about it in my house with my two high school boys is you don't always have to get it right, 
but you always have to make it right because we're not always gonna get it right. But even when we don't get it right, when we are able to make it right, there's something about that that fills in the gaps of integrity. You know, when I think about uh, Galatians chapter five, the, the fruit of the spirit, Again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If you're in Galatians chapter five and you look for the command, like what is God actually telling us to do? What's the step of obedience for us? There's only one command in Galatians chapter five. You know what it is? It's not about doing the fruit of the Spirit. God doesn't say, man, you should love more. You should have more joy. You should have more peace. He doesn't tell us to do the fruits. When it comes to the command in Galatians chapter five, the command is this, walk in the spirit. Because Paul's convinced the more you walk with God, the more the character traits of God becomes more a part of your character. It's not about just trying harder. It's not just about trying to do these things more. It's about walking with God because here's what we believe. Transformation is relational. The more time you spend with somebody, the more you're transformed by who they are. Now we know this to be true because if you've ever been around a group of people or a couple of people who just spend an obscene amount of time together and they start like looking alike and talking alike and acting alike and finishing each other's sentences, you know what I'm talking about? And so like, uh, again, I've got two high school boys. We have high schoolers over at our house all the time. My favorite are high school girls. They're the best at this. Two high school girls that hang out all the time. I'm telling you, they become twins. You think they're siblings because they start looking alike and talking alike and acting alike and finishing each other's sentences. Why? Because transformation is relational. Brought one more example. Uh, Maybe you've seen this on social media where where people start looking like their pets. Have you seen this? I brought a couple pictures of you to see this. Here's the the first picture. I mean, come on now. It's hilarious. Uh, Here's the, the second one for you. This kid looks exactly like his dog. So fun. Uh, This third one, this dog should be ordained. I'm convinced of it. (laughs) And then the last one's my favorite. This is like rolls for days. So fun. And so if it's true with people and their dogs, it's true with people and people that transformation is relational. It's also true in your relationship with God. It's not about doing more or trying harder or trying to be more good. It's about spending more time with the one who is. Because the more you're walking with him, the more his character infuses into your character. You don't always have to get it right. You just learn to make it right. One of the best biblical examples that I'm aware of around this is King David from the Old Testament. Now, now you know that King David was far from perfect. Uh, He committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. He sent Bathsheba's husband to the front lines of battle where he'd surely be killed. And so David was guilty of both adultery and murder. He was far from perfect. And yet the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. Why? It's not because David always got it right. It's because David always had a heart to make it right. And some of the Psalms are Dave, David's like cries of his heart to reconnect with God after totally blowing his integrity. And what I love about his heart of of making it right that I think can teach us a lot in our journey today, he says this, this is is off the pen of David, Psalm 139. He says this, search me God and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. And look what he says here. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see David going to God and go, God, there are gaps in my integrity. See if there's any offensive way in me. And in those moments, God, I need your goodness to infuse who I am. Now, what are the things that we take to God? I wanna make this really practical. Uh, For me, there's a filter that I use of a series of questions that help me determine the gaps that I need to bring before God. I wanna share with you those three questions and maybe it serves you as well. Here's the first question I ask myself. Where am I defensive? Because oftentimes the thing that I'm emotionally reacting to and I'm being defensive about, typically I'm protecting a gap in my integrity, something that's not quite right. I tell this to my 17 year old all the time. I'm like, bro, the madder you get, the more guilty you look, right? Because when we get really defensive, it's often masking something that we know is not right. 
And our big reaction is the way that we can mask whatever it is that's going on. So I often ask myself the question, where am I defensive? And I take that to God. God, in this moment, search my heart. God, know me. See if there's any offensive way in me. God, let your goodness infuse my life in my heart. Lead me in your way everlasting. That's the first question. Where am I defensive? Here's the second question. Where am I critical of others? What I find to be true about me, I don't know if it's true about you. Oftentimes what I'm most critical of others about is actually the thing that I hate most about myself. Not always true, but I find it's a lot of times true. Where am I criticizing somebody? Where am I being judgmental? Where, where, am, I, where am I gossiping about somebody or something? Most of the time, it's less about them and it's more about what's going on inside of me. And if I'm willing to take that to God and say, God, search me, God, know me. See, if there's any offensive way in me, God, I want your goodness to infuse my character. Lead me in your way everlasting. Where am I defensive? Where am I critical of others? And what am I keeping a secret? Now, I think there's a difference between what I would say, keeping something a secret and keeping something private. I think you should keep a lot of stuff private. Uh, I don't think everybody should know everything about you at all times, but somebody should know. Uh, There's certain things we should keep private because not everybody can be trusted with the most private pieces of our story. And that's okay. There's wisdom in that. But if you ever find a situation where nobody knows, that's a secret because a trusted source can know anything. And if I find myself hiding something, it's oftentimes, it's an indication of a gap in my integrity. Do you find yourself deleting your browser history? You have a credit card that a spouse doesn't know about. Do you find yourself in a text message conversation or a DM conversation with somebody who's not your spouse that they don't know anything about? What are you keeping a secret? That's oftentimes an indication of it's a gap in my integrity that I haven't gotten it right, but I gotta make that right. And so I go to God and I say, God, search me. God, know me. God, see if there's any offensive way in me. God, I want your goodness to infuse my character, to lead me in the way everlasting. Here's the truth. Only God is good. There are moments that we have goodness, but our goodness just has gaps in it. But the more we make it right with God, the more his goodness fills the gaps in our lives that you and I will experience more and more of God's goodness because you and I are living the lives. We are living in the house that we are building. And so for some of you, as I think about maybe a next step and challenge you to take a next step, uh, maybe your simple next step is to think about that filter of those questions and take those to God, allow God to do some work in your own life, in your own heart. Uh, maybe for others of us, we've never surrendered our lives to God in the first place. And maybe you're like, man, my life's pretty messy. And if I'm really, really honest, some of the mess is self-induced. Here's the truth about God. You don't have to clean your life up to come to God. You're never too far from him. That wherever you're at, you just come to him. He's the one that does the cleanup in our lives that we couldn't do anyway. And so I want you to know, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what mistakes you've created, no matter how big the gaps of integrity are, you are never too far from God. You can always come to him. Come to him today. Give your life to him today. Surrender your life to him today. I've heard in a couple weeks, we get to celebrate baptism at a lake. That sounds like a lot of fun. Maybe I should come back for it. If you wanna give your life to follow Jesus, 
You can go public with your faith on that day through baptism. If you wanna talk to somebody about that, learn more, uh, go to the new to the Hills area in the lobby. Somebody would love to talk with you about what that next step could look like. But for now, let me pray for you, pray for all of us. God, we say thanks for who you are. God, you're a good, good God. God, you're perfect, you're flawless, you're impeccable in every possible way. And God, we fall short. And so we're grateful for your grace and your mercy that allows us to be restored to you. But Father, in this moment, I just ask we'd be willing to, to ask the hard questions. Where am I defensive? Where am I critical? What am I keeping a secret? God, there's things that we haven't gotten right, but would you give us the courage to make it right? And through it, would you bring more and more of your character of goodness and make it more and more true of our lives? God, we love you. We say thanks in Jesus' name, amen.